speaking to hot issues. I'm quite sure that you've heard about the proposed 40-year development plan. What is it? What's a development plan? How could this be different from the other development plans that we've heard about? You heard about Nkrumah's five-year development plan, seven-year development plan, and the attempt by the late Honorable Bawei, the Minister of Finance, to develop a hundred-year plan or something to that effect. That's what we are discussing today on Hot Issues. Welcome to the program. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. And as I indicated from the beginning, we are having a conversation about a proposed 40-year development plan. 40 years? What is it? What's a development plan? How would that enable us to resolve the many problems which confront us? And we are privileged to have with us Dr. Nimoy Thompson of the National Development Planning Commission. So you're welcome. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. What is this 40-year development plan? What mm -hmm. is it? Well, uh, there's a legal basis for that. There, there's a, uh, people have been asking, and I thought I should start with that. In 2011, uh, the, the law was passed as part of efforts to manage our petroleum revenues efficiently. So the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, Act 815, actually asked or proposed that a long-term national development plan should be prepared and approved by parliament as a way of guiding the, the, the utilization of, of, of our petroleum revenue, mostly tilted towards infrastructure development, but also social uh, development. And then in 20, even before the, in 2010, uh, the government has set up the Constitution Review Commission, which went around the country. They started with 44 issues that did not include development planning. But by the time they were done, there were such popular requests for a uh, long-term development plan that Chapter 3 of their report actually was based, uh, devoted entirely to a long-term national development plan. And since then, we've had uh, the Christian Council, the Ghana Institute of Planners, and some individuals and other organizations all calling for a long-term national development plan. What would be the advantage of that? It would give us a much longer perspective for national development. Infrastructure, for instance, take, typically takes more than four years to, to develop. And we feel, uh, based on the submissions and the requirement of the budget, that if we have a much longer time frame, it will, and of course it has to be structured in such a way that governments can come and go without losing focus of what we need to do as a country. And so that's what we've, we've been doing as the state agency mandated to prepare development plans of any duration, whether they are short term, whether they are medium term or long term. And that's what we've been doing. In the past three weeks, we decided to go on courtesy visits, just basically mobilize political support and get the public to understand even before the launch on August 4th. So we started with President Mahama and then visited the two former presidents, uh, President Rawlings and President Kufu, and then visited the Speaker and then the Chief Justice. Uh, we also visited uh, Honorable J.H. Mensah, who we consider to be the father of, of uh, development planning in Ghana, having worked perhaps one of the few people in Ghana now who can say that I actually saw Kwame Nkrumah and worked with Kwame Nkrumah. And so they worked on the seven-year development plan. And then I also uh, uh, went to Parliament and explained the whole process, the rationale, and how it will evolve once the process has been launched. And so we, we are looking forward to that. But I need to make it clear that there's as yet no long-term development plan. We are going to launch the process on August 4th. It should take around a year. So it should end towards the end of next year. We are proposing October next year. Mm -hmm. And then for uh, all of 2017, the government of the day will then prepare the next medium-term plan that will then uh, uh, bring expression to the long-term national development. But plan. what is a development plan? Um, a development plan basically, to, to, you, to, to take a technical route, is a program with projects and activities aimed at meeting certain objectives and goals. In our case, what we've done, again, we've taken, we, we reviewed our record, we reviewed the record of other people and come up with uh, a long-term plan that is unique to Ghana based on the Constitution. The directive principles of state policy actually gives us the broad principles and guidelines for preparing a national development plan. So 
at the highest level, and what, what we call the long-term national development plan is actually what we may call a framework. It's a high-level plan that one specifies the vision that we want. What kind of society do we want to see us become over the next 40 years? And the Constitution, specifically the Director of Principles of State Policy, actually provides that answer, that we should aim at creating a just, free, and prosperous society. And out of that, we derive goals. So the goals for the economy, it must be inclusive and resilient. Uh, in terms of society, it must be equitable and tolerant and so forth. In terms of environment, we need to build safe and resilient communities. In terms of uh, the uh, institutions, we need to build efficient and responsive institutions. And also emphasize our position in the global economy, We've, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the world as a whole, not just the economy. It looks like uh, we, even though we are still active in the global economy, it hasn't been as focused as it should be. So that's at the highest level. And we all agree, and this is what the, the conversations that we're going to be having in the regions will, will all revolve around. So we'll work towards objectives from those goals derived from the Constitution. And then, after that, each government that comes in will have to prepare what we call an operational plan. This is what brings expression to the high-level plan. And they have the flexibility to approach it. So, for example, to use uh, uh, the example Dr. Boucher used earlier today, we might, in the long-term national development plan, decide that by a certain date, every city and town in Ghana must have a central sewage system. And then we'll set the targets as we move towards that. But each government will come in with its own plan. And at the end of its term, it will be measured as to how close it has gotten to the target. If it doesn't meet that, then, it, of course, it will be up to the public to decide whether or not to, to wh whatever the public wants to do. But we will put in place mechanisms for monitoring and evaluation at almost every level. NDPC itself produces what we call the annual progress report. We've been producing it since 2002. We'll continue to produce that within the context of a long-term national development plan. The Constitution requires the president to report every year through the State of the Nation address at, on measures that have been taken to meet what is prescribed in the uh, director principle. Let, 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 let's stick to defining mm -hmm. what a development plan is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I want I want the, the okay. viewers okay. to have a proper understanding of mm -hmm. what a development plan mm -hmm. is. Now, if mm -hmm. there was a document which stated that uh, we want to build a prosperous Ghana, a just society society in which its resources are equitably distributed and that in the next five years all cities should have light everybody should go to school and so on would that be a development plan it would be a develop those would be the targets the first ones you mentioned there are, there are technical distinctions and perhaps i need to re-emphasize those the issue of a just uh, free and prosperous society is a high level what, what do you mean by a just a free and prosperous society. So, for instance, we start with a just society. It's more than just judicial justice, economic justice, uh, social justice. And then you need to then work your way back and operationalize them. What is economic justice? Uh, employment, decent work, decent wages, and so forth and so on. So as you work your way back to the specifics of it, it then falls upon each government now to come into government with its plan, Within the plan, you should have programs. I, I, I want us to make a distinction mm -hmm. between drawing up a wish list mm -hmm. and having a development plan. Mm -hmm. Because right now, we are just talking about a wish list. No, the wish list is at the highest level. When we talk about goals and vision, it's a wish list. Yes, that's the nature of it. Mm -hmm. It's basically dreaming. You need to dream big. For instance, I don't know if you saw uh, Steve Jobs, the founder of, or the co-founder of Apple, the day he released the... Uh, video phone and he said listen we used to dream about this as kids that these were just comic things now it's actually reality so you're allowed at the highest level to dream that you have this perfect society but then you reverse uh, you work your way backwards and then operationalize that dream through uh, four-year plans in which you come in now it's no longer just a dream but you work towards that through a plan and that plan is made up of programs programs on uh, uh, education programs on health programs on housing. Should we not be thinking also mm -hmm. about the capability, the capacity mm -hmm. uh, to make that vision, that wish list, a reality? Mm -hmm. okay. So far, we are just talking about no. the dream. Yes, yes, yes. What about the capacity no, no question to realize the dream? No question about that yeah. at all. One of the proposals, again, let's bear in mind that the process itself has not started. We are now laying the groundwork for that. But when the process starts, we will put out there the outline that we've proposed as technocrats. It will have to be filled through the consultations. And as technocrats, we've also come up with a list of what we call drivers. 
that will drive this transformation. Ultimately, it's transformation if you're talking about 40 years. The society must be transformed fundamentally for the good. But we also have identified a number of drivers, about six of them, that we believe we need to deal with as a precondition for even living up to these dreams. One of them is building the capacity, what we call human capital development. That we need to build the capacity of the individual, not just in terms of education, not just in, in terms of health and nutrition, but in terms of decent housing. Even these, as the UN talks about energy poverty, we need to alleviate all those things because what happens with doom so for instance, uh, uh, or the doom part happens. Those who, who are relatively well off can afford generator and so forth, so their children, for example, can do homework. Those who cannot do that. Therefore, go to bed and perhaps they show up the next day in school without the homework done. So the rich then proceed. And the, so all these things will have to be clarified and operationalized and put in programs that then find expression in projects. So that's one. It, the issue of, of, of uh, human uh, capital development is one of them. So that is dealing with the issue of capabilities. We'll also uh, we're talking about capability, I'm not just talking about uh, the brain power mm -hmm. or, 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 or the development of a technological base and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. I'm also talking about resources, mm -hmm. like, like, like how are you going to fund projects and so on. Mm -hmm. that's, Those that's must what, necessarily be yeah, part yeah. of a development that, that's plan. That's what I'm going, I'm, I'm going through the list. Mm -hmm. So the issue, human capa capability or capacity mm -hmm. is a precondition. In terms of the development of infrastructure, for example, the issue of land, we've identified that as a major constraint that needs to be addressed before we can actually achieve these uh, lofty ideals. If we would, because infrastructure presupposes the acquisition of land. And if you followed what is going on in India and China, for example, land acquisition has been a major constraint on certain developers. So we put that as one of the drivers. And the, in the development of infrastructure, um, okay, let me just step back a little bit. For example, Within the context of the long-term national, the higher deals thing, we have what we call frameworks or modules that drive that. So one of them, and we've just developed that, is the National Spatial Development Framework that actually gives us an idea of how the fiscal environment should look in Ghana within the next 40 years, starting from 2018. And it's significant because in your introduction, you talked about the seven-year development plan. The seven-year development plan had a companion plan called the National Fiscal Development Plan that a lot of people don't know about. But it was supposed to give fiscal expression to the social and economic aspirations in the mother document. And if you look at that, and I'll give you a copy later on a soft copy, we'll actually put it on our website. It spells out exactly how cities and towns and ultimately rural areas were going to evolve in Ghana. So within that, it, it, it projects energy demand on a town by town and city by city basis between 1963 and 1970 where factories were going to be located the cost of factories by both the state and private sector the number of people who will be so we had that and then in 1966 we cannot drop that so thereafter we kind of flew blind we've only now um, February 2015 finally came up with a framework and along with that, we're also developing a national infrastructure plan. The two will go hand in hand. And this is where the issue of capability is coming. Because within the national infrastructure plan, we have the capability section that will deal precisely with these issues. And that is also uh, linked to the issue of human resource cap uh, capabilities. Because for now, whenever we talk about uh, building roads and highways, the instinctive reaction or assumption is that oh, the Chinese will come and build them for us. We want to change that mindset. In fact, one of the drivers is attitude do not change. And not just in terms of obeying the law and other, but even believing in ourselves. I personally, in my lifetime, would like to live to see the day where I'll probably be walking down the streets in Beijing and I see Kojo Mensa International Construction. We need to begin to believe in ourselves as one of the drivers. And in the National Infrastructure Plan, there's actually a section that addresses the issue of capability. So if we decide, for example, that we're going to have railways all throughout the country or freeways, as we call it in the National Development Plan for roads and whatnot, then the question is, how many engineers are we going to require? How many architects? And what kinds of engineers? Civil engineers, structural engineers, uh, accountants, First, we need to begin to quantify all these things and begin to prepare. We shouldn't assume that the Chinese will come and do all that for us. Because they do that, they get paid, they take the money out. I want to, well, not me, but we want a situation where, yes, some Chinese may come in all right, but Ghanaians should also be able to go to China and build roads there. 
and therefore make money. So the issue of capabilities is a very, very critical one. There's also, the, uh, I've mentioned infrastructure development as a, uh, a driver, the issue of technology, science and technology, and innovation. Not just techno technological innovation, but even the way we do things. The way we plant corn, for example, can simply be adjusted without any additional cost, and it could lead to uh, an increase in, in harvest and so forth. So we are looking at these practical mediums for bringing expression to the high-level goals that ultimately will lead to a transformation of, the, of the, both the economy and society. Is it possible, mm -hmm. in real practical terms, mm -hmm. to have a development plan that everybody accepts? Is that possible? That would be the ideal uh, that everyone will accept. And so far, I'm happy to say that of all the six parties that we've uh, uh, visited so far, all of them, Give them, uh, uh, give us their full support. No, and they didn't give the full support to a development plan. No, no, yes, they did. They gave the full support uh, mm -hmm. to a process mm -hmm. which will bring about a development plan. Well, if you want to state it that way, but they did ultimately. They they give our, us our support in the sense that yes, they said we all agree. But there was some. Yeah, but there's no development plan now that they there's can no yes, support. Okay, okay yeah. no, no. But you can still support the idea and before you even give yourself your support to the process. So I agree to the idea, but and yes, I now support the process. So it's a different. You see, you no, can. The question is, mm -hmm. is it possible mm -hmm. to have a development plan that everybody accepts? That's what we are aiming at. Is it possible for us to have any national decision that everybody accepts? Possibly not. Possibly not. But you want, there's always a preponderance of public views that drive. If you're waiting for a situation where everybody accepts something, no country will ever develop. You want the majority to buy into it. And the minority who may not, at least you need to convince them. But I don't think you have a consensus, 100% agreement on any development initiative anywhere. I don't you, think Ghana would be but, an exception. But you do appreciate mm -hmm. that no true political blocks and ideological blocks mm -hmm. have the same vision of society. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we are operating with the constitution that we all agree. The constitution is not an ideological block. No, no, no. Just, just one second. The ideology becomes simply a tool. An ideology is not an end in itself. It's always a means to achieving certain ideas. No, 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 no. no. What, what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. no two ideological blocks have the same vision of society. And that's why I'm saying that we are not talking about two or three ideological blocks. We are talking about a vision in a document that we all accept, irrespective of our ideological orientation. But is that sure. possible? No, no, but the Constitution is there. If you read the directive principles... The Constitution the is not... It's not what? It's not an ideology which is imposed on everybody. The Constitution is a guiding law. Yes. What I'm saying is uh -huh. that, is it possible... For all ideological blocks, you have the same vision of society. We all, as far as I'm concerned and as far as I know, we all, irrespective of our ideological orientation, we all accept the Constitution as our guiding principle for governing ourselves. Now, the short term, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, the short term or medium term plans can easily take on the ideological orientation of any government at any point in time. That is, is a given. So a government may come in and say, okay, we all agree that, and I don't see any ideology that will say, well, we don't want everyone to have uh, 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 access to sanitation. We don't want a central sewage system and so forth and so on. That's how the operationalized level. But, 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 but the desire uh, mm -hmm. or the wish that everybody should have good sanitation is not a plan. It's not a development plan. No, no, it's an That's idea. That's a wish list. It's, it, no, no, no. It's, it's, an, it's an objective that you work on, but... The, this is where the, the issue of ideology comes in. And again, I have to emphasize that ideology has placed in the larger scheme of things through the medium term and the short term plans that will have to be derived from the long term. You can come in and say, well, my ideology, uh, based on my ideological convictions, I think basic education must be provided entirely by private schools. Whatever it is, we'll all judge you by the objective of 100% basic education enrollment whether you use this ideology or that ideology. So ideology still has a place in there. But it's a question of whether or not your ideology would deliver. So no, ultimately no, no, the no, public, no, no, no. why not? There, there, there's a problem. Mm, okay, which is? Which is mm -hmm. the question again. Mm -hmm. Is it possible mm, to have a vision of society which is common to all political blocks and ideological blocks? That's the question. What do you think of the directive principles of state policy? 
Well, I'm asking the question. No, but that's what I've been saying that you keep uh, uh, ignoring that. So I'm, I, I, no, I, I want to understand thing. what because you're doing. Because the director principles of state policy gives us that sir, vision. Sir, sir, okay. sir, sir. You okay. are the one okay. who is proposing to do something. My role here okay. is to ask the questions. No problem at all. So that you explain for me and the viewers okay. to understand. All right, let me try one more time. Yes. The directive principles of state policy mm -hmm. gives us that common vision, irrespective, I think I've used that word too many times, mm -hmm. irrespective of our ideological orientation. Mm -hmm. We've all signed up to that. It's mm -hmm. the constitution that guides us, that we want to just free and prosperous society. Mm -hmm. We've all like, accepted that. But that so is not a development plan. That's exactly. a wish list. Yeah, exactly. I'm exactly. not disputing that. You're yeah. not listening to me. I'm not disputing that. Okay. I'm, I okay. keep saying okay. that the, 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 where ideology comes in is mm -hmm. the medium to short and short-term plans. Mm -hmm. That no one is disputing that. Mm -hmm. So we are basically saying the same thing. Okay. There is still room for ideology. So, There's still so, room so, for political So what do you propose to do? Ideology. What is it mm -hmm. that you call the 40 year development plan mm -hmm. is it just the wish list it's not just a wish list let me okay. give you the key elements of it is mm -hmm. the vision stated explicitly derived from the directive principles of state policy mm -hmm. it is the goals as i stated earlier the mm -hmm. goal of having a, 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 a um, an inclusive and resilient economy in terms of the economy society being equitable and uh, tolerant and so forth those are goals we all aspire to that and, and all the political parties we we've met None of them said, well, we oppose. They said, no, right. We all agreed to that. Then with, from the national consultations that we're going to have, we're going to move from vision to goals to objectives. Objectives now become how we measure, how we measure progress towards these ideals. And the progress will have to, broken, will have to be broken down into periods. So each government that comes in with its own ideological interpretation of things, with its own manifesto, We'll have to work towards those objectives derived from those goals which are derived from the vision. So I really don't think there's any divergence in the question of vision. We all believe, uh, uh, unless there, there are any contrary views there, but we all would like to live in free, just, and prosperous societies. The differences are how we get there, and that's where ideology comes in. And so the medium-term plan then will be, well, I would rather provide free or uh, uh, universal education mostly through pri uh, primary. There are those who may say, well, we'll m do it through state edu uh, uh, facilities. There are those who may have a blend of some, that's ideology. Or there are those who think, listen, if you leave it to the market, there may be those who will not, not necessarily benefit from it. So there must be a state role in there. Or maybe let's have some blend of the two. The market, one of the most interesting things really is that, for example, of the United States, where uh, virtually everything is solved through the markets except high school education. Over 95% of high school students in America are proudly in public schools because they've, they've chosen, they've kind of ring fence that around the ideological foolishness that, listen, we may solve things by markets and whatnot, but basic education must be provided by the state. We, on the other hand, for some reason, are moving away from that. So ideology can even be flexible in some instances. But it's interesting that you should focus on that because when we met the political parties, and I've, I've, we've actually listed the key messages that we took from each and every one of them. The last one we visited uh, last Friday was... Uh, uh, the Progressive People's Party. And they said the key message was that there must be a new Ghanaian if we are to achieve these ideals, or mm -hmm. wish list as you, you call it, that we have a new uh, mindset. Okay, no. well, hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are in conversation with Dr. Nimoy Thompson. And as you do know, he's a very eminent economist. Uh, he's paid his dues in the various debates and so on, very active on the national political scene, and now is working with the National Development Planning Commission. Now we are told that the commission is, is working on a 40-year development program or plan. Now, sir, we have immediate problems, very, very immediate problems. We are, don't appear to be able to deal with our immediate problems, and we are thinking about 40 years. Why? Well, uh, first of all, the, the plan that we're proposing will start in 2018, between 2018 and 2057. Nevertheless, the existence of short-term uh, problems, the, the, the resolution of those problems is not mutually exclusive from trying to think into the future. Indeed, if we had thought about the future 40 years ago and made the necessary investments back then, we wouldn't have the problems we're having now, especially in the area of infrastructure that takes 
a long time for things like energy, dams, and whatnot to come to fruition. So the two are not uh, mutually exclusive at all. We can still continue to pursue solutions to our immediate problems, such as electricity and so forth and so on, the, 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 the currency, which has now stabilized somewhat, and still begin to think into the future such that we, we promise ourselves that 40 years from now, our children or our grandchildren should never, should never find themselves uh, uh, in a doomso situation again. As the Jews like to say, never again. So it's possible. Yes, we can do that. Uh, I should also point out that the, the 40 year thing that we are uh, proposing, the framework, the uh, time frame that we are proposing, is actually within an even much longer time frame proposed by the AU, which is called the Agenda 2063, 50 years between 2013 and 2063. So they have an even longer time frame than we do. Shouldn't our policy makers and planners be focusing on attention? on saving the country now, on dealing with the problems which face us now, before venturing into the, the distant future. The, the thing is that what we call distant future will, will one day become the present, just as the present yeah, but today. But now it is not. Yeah, no, no, but that's, that you need to prepare for that. We need Agreed. To pre- exactly. So that's if, what if we can't do today, uh-huh. how can we do tomorrow? What we are doing today, we are not being as successful as we should, and we need to learn from that. It doesn't mean we, we run a huge risk by thinking because we have short-term problems, you forget the future. Otherwise, those problems will emerge again. The reason why, again, we are having these problems is that we never really paid that, that much attention 40 years ago. And if we make that mistake of saying, well, we have these problems, and so we're not, we're not thinking into the future, we are only going to saddle our children with even more problems, but, worse than this. But, but so if you have a 40-year development pro- mm-hmm. program, mm-hmm. doesn't this start from year one? It does. And lead on to year two? And precisely. And lead on to year three? I'm glad you're saying I'm that. I'm saying that why don't we start from year one? Of course, well, it, it, the thing raised, it, if we finish with the consultations, which will be next year, we'll have 2017 for ministries, departments, and agencies, or uh, metropolitan or districts to prepare a plan towards 2018. So we still have time towards going there, towards starting at 2018. It doesn't mean that we cannot uh, do that which needs to be done now. And doing that which needs to be done now doesn't mean that we cannot think of 2018. And as I said, we've actually laid out the key elements or outlines of it that okay so assuming that we start from 2018 that would mean the equivalent of 10 election cycles for example beginning in 2020 and the last the 10th election will be 2056 so at least we have the guideposts for that at the same time over a 40 year period four year uh, uh, medium term plans that would be 10 so 10 four year medium term plans that the 10th li- the one will end in 2057 so at least we have a sense of how to proceed looking at these guideposts the question then is the, the policies, the objectives, and the strategies to be implemented by each government at any given time. So, again, we can still take care of what is going on now. As I said, we have two, a couple of years, because in 2017, we'll be celebrating our 60th anniversary. It will be a time for reflection. Look back at what we've done, what we've done well, what we haven't done so well. There's a general sense that because of the current challenges, we've been a failure. I happen now to share in that view. Despite all our challenges, if you look at the, the long-term trajectory of our development, I think we've come quite a long way. Uh, too bad that we're running into these things. But 2017 is going to be a moment for reflection. And thereafter, we need to begin to look forward. Now, we've covered 60 years. Let's see what happens the next 40 years. 2057, Ghana will be 100. What kind of society do we envision? The bi thing you mentioned was actually like a futuristic budget. What kind of budget will be read in the year 2057? And it's actually quite interesting if you read it. We've, we've put a, a copy on our website also. You can check it out. It's actually quite interesting. Okay. <laughs> now, sir, mm-hmm. if you're looking into the future 40 years from now, you must definitely make some assumptions. Yes. What are those assumptions? That we'll have. And how realistic would those mm-hmm. assumptions be? They, they'll be realistic in the sense that there are always shocks. In fact, the, the program that we've... I'll come back specifically to that answer, but, but let me give you a bit of information that I hadn't given before. Uh, we propose four 10-year revisions of the long-term national development plans. That is to be done by Parliament because it's a representative of the people, but with input from NDPC and other uh, uh, stakeholders, to use the cliche. So 2027, 20, 2037, 20, 2047, 2057, 20, there will be these 10 year revisions of the long term development plan in order to take account of changed circumstances. Because things do change. 20, 25 years ago, a long term development plan that aimed at making sure that every home had a telephone 
would have been overtaken by events by now. These days, we don't even talk about every home having a telephone. It's every individual having a... So within that context, there will be 10 years intervals for us to review that. But even before you get to the 10 years, the four-year medium-term plans themselves are subjected to monitoring and evaluation by NDPC as part of our official mandate. And then we'll point out where we think in economics they call turning points, where certain things that you assumed in the past are not... Mani uh, manifesting themselves the way they should. And so you make appropriate. So a plan really is not cast in stone. Uh, uh, as I like to say, there are no guarantees in life. But you can, with reasonable degree of accuracy and confidence, have some sense of where the future is going to go. When I was a student t over 20 years ago, I remember reading the, uh, uh, a strategic plan of a Japanese company that was 250 years long. 250 years. I'm sure they've thrown that plan <coughs> No, 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 no. It was interesting. If you read the elements of it, they... One of the elements of it was that in 250 years, there would be hotels on the moon. And they wanted to be at the forefront of it. We haven't even come anywhere close to that. And there are already efforts in that, in that direction. So they will probably exceed the moon ambition and then think of something. But it's good. No country I know of became great by not thinking great. You must think great to be great. If you think little in the corner, you're going to remain in that corner for the rest of your life. So we need to think. That was one of the beautiful things about Nkrumah that probably scared his detractors and they had to get rid of him. Because while others were fighting for independence in their own little corners, he was talking about continental unity and all that. And they said, no, this guy is dangerous. <laughs> this guy is dangerous. We need to do something about that. By what you have said, mm -hmm. are you not admitting that changing variables and the possibility that assumptions may not be realistic are in themselves a barrier to drawing up a 40-year development plan. A, even a one-year development plan is subjected to assumptions that need to change. Yeah, but, but there's no, a vast difference between a one-year development plan and the, a 40-year no, development the, the, plan. The argument here is that all plans, whether they be one year, whether they be five years, whether they are built on assumptions, even economic and generally social science theories, everything is based on assumption. So you need, the question is, that in something, something we call assumptions interrogation or analysis. You need to interrogate that to have a, a good sense of where you will be at any given point in time. So how realistic is your assumption is as good as the kind of analysis you do. So that's, so, but the issue of assumptions is a fact of life and it's a fact of planning. There's always some assumption because we don't really have a full understanding of what the future holds for us. But we have a, a specific understanding. But we have a general idea of where we think we want to be, we want to be free, we want to be just, we want to be prosperous. That's a very general, even nebulous idea. But specifics as to what constitutes free, what constitutes just, what constitutes prosperous, those are the things that constitute the, 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 uh, the, the fodder for uh, our everyday or regular economic management. And that actually makes the whole enterprise of development exciting because you, you're kind of shooting at a moving target. And at some point, you really have to hit some. And that's the excitement of it. I suppose it becomes a, a, a still target and you lose the excitement of it. <laughs> so you, you have to keep going after that. <laughs> Does the National Development Planning Commission have any input in the drawing up of the budget, the national budget? Yes, we work very closely with the Ministry of Finance, yeah. They have the primary responsibility, but we, we are collaborating agents. We make sure that they reflect the medium-term plans. We are responsible for planning. And currently, we, we are, are in the middle of uh, implementing the Ghana Shared Growth and Development Agenda. So we prepare that with the help of the Ministry of Finance, and then they prepare the budget with the help of NDPs, just to make sure that there's some alignment between the two. And the budget is for one year. Yeah, it's for one year. Do you realize mm -hmm. that this last budget, mm -hmm. you know, only six months into its, into its lifetime had to be reviewed? Yes. Because the assumptions were wrong. Yes. Well, the, now, if the assumptions for one year mm -hmm. were so drastically wrong that we needed a review, what about the assumptions for 40 years? It may, they may be drastically wrong equally, or they may be marginally wrong. That's what makes them assumptions. Then why, have, why should we be working with the maybes? That's the nature of planning, isn't it? That's the nature of planning. Yeah, but we, planning also tries to eliminate the maybes. No, no, no. It minimises. No one ever anywhere okay. eliminates it, the maybes. I say it tries Yeah, to. yeah but it, it tries minimizes. To. Yes, yes. It ought to try. No, it's the nature of management globally mm -hmm. that you minimise risk and the likelihood of its occurrence. Mm -hmm. But you do not completely eliminate that. So it's part of it. It's part of minimizing the constraints, the likelihood that that risk will emerge. You need to minimize that. And, this, and don't forget for, for, and these, you see, the, the, why 
uh, are the assumptions so drastically wrong to, to, to use your, your, the term that you use? Because we haven't dealt with some of the institutional issues uh, that will help us. And as I said, the first goal is for us to move towards building an inclusive and resilient economy. That means building the institutions. Certainly, we need to resolve the issue of electricity uh, uh, power. That can that is like the end all and be all and everything. And everyone recognizes that. And that itself is a reflection, the persistence of it is a reflection of weak institutions. And so, as I said, one of the key drivers of this kind of transformation that we seek to promote over 40 years is to re re resolve institutions such that in the, in the future, there will be a deviation f uh, between the ideals we aspire to and the reality. But the whole trick is to minimize it. In fact, if you do econometric analysis, the whole the essence, the essence of economic analysis is to minimize deviations. Not necessarily. If you're lucky and you get zero deviation, that's fine. But that's seldom the case. The whole trick is to minimize it. And then you, but when it becomes wide, especially when it's, uh, that is propelled by external shocks, uh, such as a fall in cocoa prices, a fall in oil prices, a fall in gold prices, and that also goes back to the issue of institutions. Currently, as things stand up, for all practical purposes, we continue to rely on cocoa. Because we hardly have much stake in the issue of oil. We hardly much, uh, have much stake in uh, gold. Nobody knows really where the money goes. We do know where the money for, for cocoa comes. And it's a bit disturbing. And these are precisely the kinds of things that we expect to put on the table during the, the, the public discussions. For us to just ask the question, exactly how are we going to get out of this? We need the ideas to do that. One of the things we put on our website is the, the speech given by Gogglesberg in 1920, announcing his 10-year program. He didn't call it a plan, he called it a program. And back then, he was uh, bemoaning our excessive dependence on cocoa and the need for us to move away from that. In fact, before cocoa came, our primary commodity, uh, export commodities were palm oil, cola, and uh, palm kernel. And then when cocoa came, they got this place, and we, we, we came to rely on and almost 100 years later, cocoa remains the bloodstream. The time has come for us to take a critical look, step back and say, no, we no longer can go this way. So what way should we go? We need to diversify production. We need to make it more resilient. We need more markets and certainly more products in the market. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And so ho hopefully you, you come to one of the public uh, uh, forums that we're holding and come and interrogate some of the issues, ask your difficult questions, and let, let us all stri uh, strive to answer them, including you. You, you join the process of answering the, your own difficult questions. Okay, okay. <laughs> Could all of this also not be a trap for future governments, in the sense mm. uh, that you draw up a wish list, mm -hmm. which may be called a development plan and so on, that in 2050 we will do this, and in 2045 we will do this, and so on. Now there's a new government which is elected, uh, which faces serious constraints and is not able to realize those dreams. And then you come back and say, but we had a plan to do this in 2045, and you are not doing that, and therefore you are incompetent, you failed. This could be a trap for future governments, couldn't it? It couldn't be, and certainly NDPC is not in a place to make judgment calls. NDPC doesn't tell this. Not the NDPC. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not NDPC. Okay. Politicians, mm -hmm. political parties could be using this as a trap for future governments. Could be. Those are hypothetical. Most yes. likely would be, uh, judging well, by current trends. Well, the, the whole idea of the exercise is for us to interrogate these issues. Again, the minimizing risks is very critical. We, there are no guarantees. We need to remind ourselves of that. But certainly, we are capable of minimizing the necessary risks. As part of the research we did to lay the groundwork for this uh, launch on August 4th, uh, we wanted to know why certain plans in the past did not succeed in terms of implementation. We found out a number of things. One of them, that uh, monitoring and evaluation frameworks were virtually non-existent in these plans. Even budgetary allocations to uh, monitoring and evaluation were not as adequate as they should have been. So those are issues we'll highlight and try to raise the level of awareness. So if we begin an, uh, imp the implementation of the plan and we still see that this problem that we flagged it's still not been addressed. Then suddenly we can reasonably conclude that we're not going to go very far. And then we have to collectively... Is it, is it, isn't it true that one of the main reasons why development plans in the past were not uh, actuated was ideological differences? Nkrumah's vision of society was substantially different from the NLC and Buzi and so on. They could not have implemented a seven-year development plan. That was not their vision of society. Yes, yes. 
Uh, but don't forget, talking about assumptions and, and radical departures and all that, even the seven-year development plan itself suffered major setbacks. But if you read in Cromer's uh, Dark Days in Ghana, he talks about the, the, the virtual collapse in cocoa prices in the very first year of the implementation. So, again, assumptions analysis. We need to build our capacity to detect turning points. It's, it's a fact of life. Yeah, but we've dealt with the problem of, uh, of assumptions yes. and how assumptions may not be true for oh, the yes. future and so on. Well, we now, I'm talking about the fact mm -hmm. that succeeding governments oh, could not implement the, the plan because it differed substantially from the kind of society that they wanted to build. Well, the, well certainly times have changed. It, uh, the seven-year development plan was produced at a time when there was one party. So it was one party's vision of what needed to be done. And LC came, they really had no party as such, but they had their own, I'm not sure if you can call it ideological uh, uh, orientation, possibly, but I can't really think of a term because it wasn't a political party. It was, it was clear. Military. It was the political See, party, it but it was a CIA-sponsored coup. Well, I'm not talking about the coup. I'm talking about the orientation. And the government the that followed the coup was uh -huh. CIA-sponsored. <laughs> okay. All right. But the, so what, his orientation was clear. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> but I just told you. You see, the, 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 the problem with some of these ideological labels is that sometimes they lead you into pitfalls. I just told you that over 95% of high school students in America are in public schools. And Americans treasure their PS, the public school system. You would think that as a capitalist nation, maybe only 25% of them are actually in high school. So the labels can be a bit confusing sometimes. Yes, one of the biggest challenges, if you look at the history, is what I call ideological inconsistency in the implementation of plans. We've learned from all that. We are now in a, South Korea, for instance, has had as many coups as Ghana. But they were very clear in their minds as to the role of the private sector. We have kind of vacillated over that period. And we've learned from all that. Now we are saying, listen, we have a multi-party system. Parties come and go. Even sometimes within particular government, thematic areas, focus in, government actually, uh, in development actually changes. Priorities do change. How do we account for all that in our own unique way of planning? And this is why we've come up with a high-level plan, operationalized through objectives, and then allowing each government to come and use its own uh, medium based on its manifesto to attain those objectives. That is the best approach that we can use now for Ghana. No other. Because, yes, Nkrumah's seven-year development plan was great. It had very good uh, lessons, some of which we can still draw upon now. But it took place in a, a completely different political economy environment, and we cannot overlook that. Hello, and welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are talking about the proposed 40-year development plan and we are in conversation with Dr. Nimoy Thompson. We are familiar with the consultations on union government. And you do recall mm -hmm. that all the reports we had in the process of the consultation was that the people of Ghana did not want multi-party democracy. And yet at the end of the day, the report of the commission was that the people of Ghana wanted multi-party mm -hmm. democracy. How are we going to make sure that this consultation truly and really reflects the wishes of our people? Well, I'm aware of UNIGOV and, and all the, the controversy surrounding that, but times have changed. There are more opportunities for transparency now. Back then, we had a single uh, public radio station, and that's all you, you were bound to listen to. Today, we have multiple channels for verifying what anybody says. We have internet. We, the process itself is now open to just about anyone. You can be sitting in the conference room and send information to Facebook or Twitter. So the circumstances are radically changed, and I believe whatever c uh, conclusion or, or, or uh, agreements we come up to will be more... Um, transparent, can be subjected to more rigorous analysis. By How are you going to make sure mm -hmm. that you actually calculate uh, to determine what the majority, for example, thinks? How are you going to make sure about that? Right. It's, it's not a census. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not a referendum. Yes, no, no. You're, you're talking to people. Yes. At the end of the day, how are you going to make sure that what people tell you is reflected mm -hmm. in your conclusions? Well, we'll certainly sift through all the uh, contributions that everyone makes, and suddenly they're going to, the, the, the strategy is to identify themes that run through. So you may have, let's say, uh, 200 submissions, and you go through them. If there may be a preponderance towards a particular direction, let's say unemployment, or the issue of, uh, of women's rights, or the issue of, of education. Then you tease out those themes, 
and then try to crystallize them into a particular goal of objective that you have. So it's the best that we can do. Obviously, as you said, it's not a census, but a census is not the only way to get the information you need. I mean, uh, surveys, participatory uh, uh, focus group discussions are all uh, uh, established techniques for eliciting information from the public that is fairly representative of what the rest of the population thinks, even though it may not be exactly what, but it's fairly representative. What if at the end of the consultations, you, the, the lettered technical people and so on, mm -hmm. came to the conclusions that uh, what the people wanted was not practical, it could not be implemented, it didn't make economic sense? What, what would happen? Well, the law says that a long-term development plan approved by Parliament. So Parliament will have to make that final call, whether they think no, it's... But at the level of your consultation, you are going to develop the development plan. Yes. You've consulted, you've gone to the regions, you've spoken to unemployed people, you've spoken to uneducated people, all kinds of people. And you are convinced that what they're saying is not practical. It doesn't make economic sense. What are you going to do? We'll, we'll, nevertheless, we, we will be required by law to submit our report to Parliament. We can then add whatever opinions or recommendations that we, we, we think could be made based on what we observe in the field. Even though the scenario you're painting is highly unlikely, but if it should happen, we we'll still make our recommendations because in policy analysis, that's what you actually do. The drawing of a development plan mm -hmm. is a highly technical business. One aspect it? of it is, yeah. The other aspect is popular. It needs to involve the people. And so it's, it's a combination of the two. As I said, the people may call for government to address unemployment, but they don't Will have to Will it always be a combination of the two, or there could be unresolvable conflicts mm -hmm. in the two? Not necessarily. You see, it, it, could, it could be purely technical, but it would lack po uh, popular legitimacy. And that's what we are trying to avoid. One reason why previous programs or plans did not really survive successive governments is that there was the belief that some of them lacked popular uh, legitimacy. So you want to move away from that. People have been saying, why are you going around and so forth and so on. Well, we could actually have done a technical document. But then we have been just that technical document. We have no electoral mandate other than the laws that says that we should do that. But blending the technical capacities of the commission on the basis of its legal mandate with popular views. Because, again, it's... But so, I'm, I'm just saying that yes, sometimes yes, yes. it is not possible to blend. Sometimes there's an unresolvable conflict. If, if it should come to that, yes, we can suddenly flag that, put that there, that this is the issue. I don't think it's unre unresolvable, per se. It, and it, actually, using that term reminds me of my uh, own school days when we were told that uh, social policies are not solved. They are resolved because they are not 100% solved. So it's not like 2 plus 2 where you get uh, 4. In social uh, uh, cases, let's say you are trying to chase away prostitutes from some area, you may be able to get rid of them, but still be some residual of that. So that's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of social problems. They are not fully solved, but they can be resolved given the fact that there may be some residuals of the problem as such, but the important thing for the common good of the society is that the bulk of the problem is resolved. But it's interesting, you just took me back to the 1990s when I was in school. <laughs> now, we are told that is the president who will launch the process. Yes. What about ownership? Who owns the process? The people of Ghana. Because the law actually says that, as I said, Act 480 says that it must be the people of Ghana whose views are then, we do the technical aspect, the technical analysis, but ultimately it's going to be owned by the people of Ghana, certainly with their, their representatives in there. Uh, as I said, and we are introducing a number of innovations actually to ensure that that happens. The whole idea of uh, inviting two representatives from each political party, including at least the head of the manifesto committee, has never been done before. We are doing that. And they will hit the road with us. We'll go all around. They will interrogate the issues as they relate to their own manifestos, report back to headquarters. Headquarters will provide feedback. So we'll be back and forth so that at the end of the process, we'll have a much clearer idea of what the issues are, such that manifestos don't go this way and the reality is, is goes this way. And I, I speak partly from experience. When I was the head of, 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 of the manifesto, or head of research and manifesto for the CPP, outside of government, it becomes very, very... I happen to have had 
a large reservoir of, of data that had built over the years. But even then, there are certain types of data that you couldn't get access to because we're out of So in the end, you may see manifestos that make promises that are completely out of line with what really exists. With this, we're actually creating the opportunity for us all to come as close as possible on the same page. And our website, which we have relaunched... Isn't that an end to multi-party democracy? In what way? If all the political parties are going to come on the same page. Not, not on the same page in terms of uh, having having a single party, but on the same page, page in terms of having access to the same information. You are trying to break the monopoly of, of, of over information by, let's say, the current government. So everyone now has access to what is happening in education, as opposed to it being the information being uh, available to one uh, source and not the other. Everyone has access to the state of agriculture, for example. So we, we are smashing that monopoly, but it doesn't mean that we are becoming homogeneous or something. No, you still, the, the information is there, but I'm sure each of those six parties will draw different conclusions from the same set of data. Well, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you very much. Good, good, for, good. For, for I've coming. enjoyed it. Very good questions. Thank I, you. I enjoyed thank it. Thank you really for coming. It. Thank you. Well, viewers, we're looking at the proposed 40-year development plan for Ghana, and we're talking to Dr. Nimoy Thompson, one of the architects of the proposed plan. Hope all of us have, uh, uh, have learned a thing or two from this conversation.